Let's start by doing something radical. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for the evening. We thank you that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And Father, we would do, we do pray that your purpose in this divine appointment for each of us individually would be met this night. We pray that you'd open our hearts to your word. We pray, Father, that your spirit would just overrule all things, our thoughts and words, that, they, that all this might edify the body, that this might draw us all into a closer communion to Jesus Christ, in whose name we do commit these things. Amen. Okay, we are in the letter to the Church of Philadelphia, the eighth session of 24 sessions of our review of the book of Revelation. And uh, I want just since we do have visitors and so on, and just by way of review, let's recognize the word is singular. It's not revelations, plural. It's amazing how many people speak of that, which means they've never read even the first sentence. The word means unveiling. The apocalypse means unveiling. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling, singular. This book is the consummation of all things. But perhaps most practically, it's the only book in the Bible that has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. And it it pronounces a special blessing to read. No other book of the Bible does that. Lots of places are you admonished to read the Word of God collectively, but this one book singles itself out above all the others. And there are about 404 verses in the book that contain over 800 allusions from the Old Testament, which is one reason that many people find it formidable. It isn't just because of the visions and some of the, the content. It's that the, their unfamiliarity with the allusions there made. If you, the more you know your Old Testament, the more comfortable this book will be to you. And... Uh, It represents the climax of God's plan for man, and let's be it personal, for you and me. The climax of God's plan for you personally and me is laid out here. Now, let's just quickly, by way of review, let's just take a look at those first couple of sentences. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto whom? Unto him. That surprises many people. Many people don't catch that. This was a gift from the Father to the Son. For what reasons? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it. So you say signified, but it means rendered into signs. And uh, by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and for, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all the things that he, what? Saw. This isn't just a vision. Many people sort of think, well, he just somehow got this phantasmagoric experience. No, he actually heard things, saw things, and we're going to emphasize that, especially when we get to chapter 4 and following. But even in chapter 1, he is confronted with a physical description, or provides from that confrontation to us, a physical description of Jesus Christ in his resurrection body, and so on. So, but the third verse is the, is the, uh, the blessing you and I are going to claim tonight. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for, the time is at hand. Now, this book gives its own outline, but before you get to the end of chapter 1, there is verse 19, in which he says, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta hereafter. These are the three divisions of the book. The first division of the book is chapter 1, the things by then he had seen, namely this vision of heaven, this vision of Jesus Christ. Right, the things which thou hast seen, part one. The things which are, that exist in the present tense, the seven churches. You understand, uh, yesterday is a memory, tomorrow is a hope. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. <laughs> oh, I got you nappy, didn't I? Okay. The things which are. The things that exist are chapters 2 and 3. And as you uh, by now have gotten, uh, I think I've gotten across, the most important, the most practical part of the entire book is chapters 2 and 3. We're going to chapter 4 and 5, the throne of God and the seven sealed book, and we'll go through all the, the chapters 6 through 19 is an expansion of a seven-year period we'll talk about. But you and I are going to watch that period from the mezzanine, I believe, and I'll show you why, both tonight and next time. The most important part of the entire book 
are these seven letters that Jesus Christ wrote. How many epistles are there in the New Testament? Most people say 21. 14 by Paul and seven others. No, there's seven you overlook by Jesus Christ personally, and they're right here in chapter 2 and 3. And of course, then after this, uh, things which shall be hereafter, that is, things that follows metatauta after these things. And the first verse of chapter 4 has that key word, and on it goes. So uh, there, that's where we're, we're focusing, obviously, on this core issue. That's why we're spending a full session on each of the seven letters, and you'll see why. And then the cha- that first chapter closes, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. This is an example how Jesus explains the signs. Most of them are explained to you, either in the book or somewhere else in the Bible. And that's the treasure hunts, to find those places. The seven stars of the angels, seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay. Now, the question you want to ask yourself is why these seven? You can make a list of 100 churches that were around in the New Testament period. And some of the most important ones aren't here. Where's the church in Jerusalem? Church at Rome. What about Antioch? It was, the, it was the headquarters for the whole outreach. None of those are here. Why these seven? And each one has this peculiar closing phrase, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. And we know there are four levels of application to these churches. These letters have four different levels of understanding. The first is local. They were real churches. Sir William Ramsey... Uh, Searched them, researched them, and uh, discovered that there were uh, uh, elements of their history that fit the letters. They had a local practical uh, issue at the time they were written, which is 95 AD. But also, you'll notice this closing phrase in each of the letters, he that hath near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church, says it's plural. Each letter applies to all churches to varying degrees. If you understand those seven letters, you can map the spiritual condition of any church, and every church will have elements of all seven, some more than others. Some are dominantly one or the other indeed, but the point is, uh, don't point your finger at other churches. The church that you're going to can, will have elements of all seven. That's why you want to understand each of the seven letters. Each one has a special application. So that's admonitory to churches in general. It's instructive to churches in general. But also, you'll notice it says, he that hath an ear... How many of you have earlobes this evening? About 90%. Okay, that's pretty good. (laughs) And of course, I'm kidding. But the point is, he that hath an ear, the Holy Spirit has designed these seven letters to apply to you personally. Again, in different degrees. And that's, that's the challenge. Now, so far, so good. You say, gee, that's like any other good biblical text. It has, it has a direct application. It has church application as a person. Okay, so far, so good. Except this one has a fourth level. And you may consider that a little, conge- uh, you know, uh, uh, a conjectural, speculative. Let me point out to you as we go that they do happen to lay out the history of the church. And if they were in any other order, this wouldn't be true. Very provocative. So we're going to go through these. Now, something else we'll do as we go, it'll be helpful for us to recognize when we lay them all out that there are seven elements to each letter. The name of the church is relevant to its message, surprisingly enough. The title that Christ chooses of himself. Each letter comes from Jesus Christ, but he adopts a different title of himself for each letter. Most of them obviously selected from the various titles that were alluded to in chapter 1. If you're a computer programmer, chapter 1 is like the data division that defines the terms. The title of Christ. And the title he picks is the one that's relevant to the central issue of that church situation. Then it's a report card. He has some good news and some bad news. He has a commendation. This is the good news. This is what you're doing well. Then he also has some concerns. Here's where you're not doing so well. There's some good news and some bad news. And out of all of that comes an exhortation. And after the exhortation, we have a peculiar promise to the individual overcomer. And then we have this closing phrase, he that hath an ear, uh, hear what the Spirit says to to the churches. So that's the package. Now the reason I emphasize this isn't just to focus on those elements as we go, but to alert you because there are four churches that have something missing. Two churches have nothing good said about them. 
Two churches have nothing bad said about them. And you won't catch that unless you're sensitive to the structure. And uh, uh, we're gonna, we'll get into that. Well, we won't go we review all the churches at this point. We'll do that uh, coming up. But, but uh, last time we did review the letter to Sardis, and it's my style to review the previous one slightly at least. In this case, reviewing Sardis, it was preceded by Thyatira, which was, which was very, very um, pagan in its structure, very descriptive of what I'll call the medieval church, very uncomfortable for those that are of a Roman Catholic background. And uh, the libraries are full of commentaries having a field day with Thyatira in terms of its apparent relationship to the Vatican and its history. Well, if that's the case, Sardis is the Reformation. And uh, it's amazing to me how many commentators have a field day with Thyatira and they don't pay attention to Sardis, which if that model is correct, Sardis refers to the Reformation era. Most of, I think most of us that are associated with that have some pride of the Reformation. Indeed, there's some of that's justified. Hey, yet, the letter to Sardis, these things say, he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. The word name, onoma, is like a label. It's the identity. It's the, the brand name on the outside uh, uh, sign, if you will. You have a name that you live, but then there are three devastating words that come from the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a name, but you're dead. Not weak, not slipping back, not failing a little bit. You guys are dead. And, uh, or some people say the frozen chosen or whatever. But anyway, um, this, is, this is something we need to understand and uh, uh, spend more time studying Sardis than some of the others. Now, the history of Sardis historically portrays its profile here. It, it fell again and again and again. It was one of these sites that presumably was impregnable, and it rested on that reputation only to be taken over several times in its history by a conqueror climbing up these unscalable gifts, uh, cl cliffs, which presumably were unscalable, but they found a way, and they captured it, not once, several times in its history. And in fact, the historian speaker, it was taken like a thief in the night. That's where the phrase comes from. And I won't go through the history again, but the main point is that it was invincible in name only. It actually was vulnerable. So Sardis represents historic, to a historian a city of failures. It became synonymous with pretensions unjustified, a promise without performance, appearance without reality, false confidence that heralded ruin. It was betrayed again and again and again by failing to be watchful and diligent. And uh, these are uh, the, uh, uh, pretty typical of the, of the competent scholars that examine this. So we, sus we suggest the possibility that what's in view here isn't the Reformation per se, because they willingly got burned in the stake for their commitment to soteriology, being salvation by faith. But as the years have gone by, the denominal ch denominational church became soft in its hermeneutical traditions. It didn't take the Bible strictly. It allegorized. Well, we spiritually, well, we, that's not really what, I know that's what it says, but this is really what it means, that kind of stuff, so what we call soft her hermeneutics. They deny the promise that Gabriel gave Mary. Gabriel told Mary that her child was going to sit on the throne of David. The throne of David didn't exist in those days. Rome ruled the place. Is that prophecy going to come true or not? We take it seriously. So we believe in the millennial reign that, that, that Jesus Christ is due to return indeed and rule the planet earth. There's over 1,800 references to that in the Old Testament. The, the, the denominational church, typically, not all, but many of them, most of them, deny Israel's role in the future. God is not finished with Israel. That's why Paul spent three chapters hammering that away on chapters. And in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine, we call the book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, that God is not finished with Israel. And that confronts our foreign policy every day because we have Christians in leadership that do not understand Israel's pr prophetic destiny. Not that we should necessarily agree with them, but we should understand that, that this is God's issue at stake. And so the, the whole challenge of the world is challenging the Abrahamic covenant. And we'll see what's going to happen here. 
And the other thing, the denominational church today, I'd suggest, has an absence of a biblical devotional life. Much of what they do is very noteworthy, but it isn't necessarily biblical. They celebrate Easter, not Passover, and so forth. We go down the list. And, of course, perhaps most tragically, there's a de-emphasis of the gospel of Christ. You can go to many of these churches for many Sundays before you hear anything about shed blood for our sins in our place. That's the gospel, the old-fashioned gospel. And they even go at the other extreme, the ordination of homosexuals. And I could make a, I, the list could go on and on. The main point is the denominational church has, is a large distance away from what you and I would consider a biblical Christian. And you find independent churches, you find home fellowships, you find many, many people have, th- since the day of Acts, met in homes and clung to a biblical point of view. But they've always been the target of aggression, not just by the Jews or the Romans, but by the denominations. Even Calvin and Luther burned people at the stake when they were in power. So the, 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 the history needs to be understood. Well, we went through each one of these uh, 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 letters, of course, and we got to Sardis. We talked about the name, the, the title, and so forth. We noticed that Sardis has nothing good said about it. There's criticism by the Lord, but there, the place where there's normally some com- he usually starts off, here's the good news. There is no good news. Um, Smyrna was just the opposite. They're the suffering, persecuted church. He had no concern. Just hang in there, guys. Sardis is the other way around. Wake up. You guys are dead, in effect. The main sobering lesson of each of these letters that we're going to study is that each church is surprised. Let's realize what that means to you and me. Every church was surprised. The ones that thought they were doing well were not. The ones that thought they weren't doing well were doing better than they thought. That should make us humble. That should make us work to understand how God sees it. Well, we're going to take Philadelphia tonight, so we'll take a look at that. Let's talk about the prophetic profile. We mentioned that these seven letters to seven churches have a prophetic role. Ephesus seems to be characteristic of what we'll call the first century church, the apostolic church. Smyrna is the persecuted church, suffering. The whole, uh, the whole uh, threat of death hung over that letter, the persecuted church, followed by the church. What, what Satan couldn't accomplish by persecution, he accomplishes by marrying the church. The church marries the world, Pergamus, a perverted marriage, and uh, 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 where the state becomes a state church. And that leads, of course, to the medieval church with all its abuses. And you will not understand the history of Europe unless you understand the history of the grasp for temporal power by the ecclesiastical authorities. Now, these first three, we noticed, had the, po- oh, the, the strange architecture. The p- promise to the overcomer was a postscript added to the body of the letter it was, for some reason. The last four have the, bo- the, po- the promise to the overcomer in the body of the letter. That, what does that mean? I don't know, but it puts them in two groups, first of all. Let's f- find out. We also will discover that this, the, the, the last group all include an explicit reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So while they're historical, on the one hand, the last four coexist until the second coming, apparently. Thyatira also has this peculiar promise that if they don't shape up, they will be in the Great Tribulation. That's rather provocative. Sardis had no definite future. We'll talk more about that when we summarize all of them, but today we'll take a look at the church that everybody says, that's us, the church of Philadelphia. People who know nothing else about the seven letters, they know we're Philadelphia. We're not those other guys. Well, we'll see here. So the letter to Philadelphia, under the angel of the church at Philadelphia. Now, everybody says Philadelphia means brotherly love. That's acceptable. Philae simply means friendly or favorable to. If you're an Anglophile or an Anglophobe, you either like or dislike Englishmen, or your Franco feel, the, the Greek feel means friendly toward, okay? Delphia is, is, the, uh, uh, is the city, so it's the friendly city, is more accurate. You always say brotherly love, and everybody has it that way, okay, fine, but it just really, it's really, it's a friendly fellowship, is the thing. And interesting enough, that's what we're going to hear about here. Here's a map, just to refresh your memory. I put Athens in the left, lower left and Istanbul in the upper right to give you a perspective. What we have here is a, a portion of Turkey that was known in, in Roman terms as Asia Minor. It's a province, uh, a counselor, uh, pro-counselor Asia. It's a, uh, a Roman uh, province. 
And uh, we started with uh, Ephesus, went up, went up the coast to Smyrna, then to Pergamos. Now we're heading down through Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. And next time we'll have Laodicea. Philadelphia is in a main artery, and so therefore it's going to be a very prosperous location. It's the youngest of the cities. It was acquired uh, by Pergamos in about 189 B.C. King Eumenes II, he was the king of Pergamos, he had a younger brother by Attalus II who was to be his successor. And these two guys were so, they liked each other so much that they became known as the brothers. They're shown on coins together, identically, same size and so forth, they, uh, they, uh, for their lo- mutual loyalty and affection. And uh, that's why uh, the, the Philadelphus was a cognomen, an epithet on, on, on uh, Attalus II. Uh, there was also a Ptolemy, a different period of time, a Ptolemy called Philadelphus. And so it just in a sense that... Uh, uh, you know, a loyal, a loyal, reliable friend. Their geographic location is, is even today the same it was back then. It's a great wine country, a wine growing country, and they still are today. And being a wine growing country, Dionysus, the uh, god of wine or god of partying, if you will, uh, was their principal deity. Um, and uh, they were very well situated on the main road between uh, from Rome to Troas and to Pergamus, Sardis, and, and the interior. So that was great. So it was a virtual gateway to the high central plateau of Asia Minor. And as such, the Romans deliberately set it up as an outreach to, they were trying to promote Greek culture. And so Philadelphia had this role of promoting for several centuries the Greek culture to the communities uh, in that region. So they were a missionary church even in, in, in in that sense. Uh, I mean, a missionary location. The church also becomes a missionary church. The name changes. There was a very huge earthquake. That area has a Greek uh, word which means the burned land. It's a highly volcanic region. As you go through there, you see lots of black rocks, lava rocks, and so forth. So it suffered repeatedly from earthquakes. And in 17 AD, there was an earthquake. We've mentioned this before because all the cities around there were affected. But uh, it's the one that devastated Sardis and 10 other cities. Huge earthquake. This is uh, recorded by Tacitus in his annals and other places. The tremors from that earthquake were reported for years afterwards. That made the people very insecure. We're going to discover they speak of the pillars and so forth, of having something solid. And that those idioms will even show up in the letter that Jesus pens here. So they suffered economic and civic disruption for, for several decades. But their names changed um, because Tiberius from Rome uh, really was very generous with financial relief and other relief because of this horrible earthquake that caused the citizens to rename the city Neo-Caesarea, or the new city for Caesar. When uh, Tiberius gets replaced by Vespasian, the name of the city was changed to Flavia, which is his family name. So it's changed again. But none of these things stick very long. Uh, the name changes very short-lived, and Philadelphia reemerges. You know how people are. They go back to the old ways, and that's what they were comfortable with. And it's interesting that we're going to see, well, today, that town on, in Turkey is called Allah Sehu, which is the city of God in uh, Arabic. But we're going to see Jesus talk about renaming that you and I will be destined, not for this city, but the, for the, the, the city that God puts his name on. You're going to see these idioms show up in the letter, interestingly enough. But let's jump in. The angel of the church in Philadelphia, first we have the title of Christ. And boy, does he pick a different title. This is really interesting to see what he says here. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. What on earth is that all about? Well, first of all, holy. If I gave you an exam, I think most of you believe you know what holy means, and I think yet at the same time, I think we could easily show that most of us don't fully understand what holy really means. And you could go through a lot of examples, but God's holiness is an attribute that should inspire in each of us a certain amount of terror or fear, or we can say a more polite term, reverence. His holiness usually is very linked to the essential need for justice and judgment. But here's the one that is holy. It's interesting that when you see the throne of God, whether it's in Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel 10, 
you're confronted with these creatures, cherubim in the one case, seraphim in the others. They may be different. They may be the same. I won't go down that path. But you'll notice that they always say, holy, holy, holy. In the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy. Do you know why? Why do they say it three times? Trinity. I got in three persons. Very good. You're good. You're close. He's declared holy at his birth in Luke 135. He was obviously declared holy at his death. And he is holy in his present office, which is praying for you. He ever liveth to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. Important to remember that. You've got, you've got a heavy prayer water on your side every day. That's what he does. He's holy and he's true. You know, it's interesting that this title that Jesus picks nails his character. That's what he's speaking from, his character. The reason he's doing this, I believe, is because of the seven, Philadelphia is faithful to being loyal, competent ambassadors. All the rest had problems. This one doesn't. We want to pay attention. The word is althinos, which is real or genuine, in contrast to falsehood. And we can go through a lot of scripture verses, but I don't think we need to beat that to death here. The prophecy of Zechariah when he's announced in Luke chapter 1. Jesus Christ's kingship of the universe rests upon the foundation of his character. He can be trusted. This is exactly the opposite of the Allah of the Quran. Setting a lot of other issues aside, the Quran presents Allah as capricious. Allah can do anything, and you're never quite sure what he will do. Read that untrustworthy. The God of Avram, Isaac, and Yaakov of the Old Testament, and certainly Jesus Christ the New, delights in making and keeping his promises. His character is what he's all about. He is trustworthy. You can count on it. You want to get into that? You can go into Psalm 2, Psalm 24, elsewhere. The key of David. Now, this, is, this phrase from the book of Revelation has more fanciful conjectures in more of the commentaries. Let's confine our focus on what the Bible says about the key of David. To find out what that's all about, you've got to go to Isaiah 22, where it's mentioned. Starting about verse 20. Uh, what's going on here is that Eliakim is, going, is, being, is replacing Shebna the treasurer. I won't go into the background, but Shebna the treasurer under Hezekiah, is a, 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 he's, he's, he's being mustered out. Eliakim is given the office of the treasurer of the king. It shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So he's going to be a first representative of the king in effect. And let's go on. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Get, verse 22 has the same phrases that Jesus is using of himself there. I'm going to suggest to you that here, even though the focus is Eliakim, the allusion is messianic, and you'll see why in a minute. Also, in verse 23, you'll, you'll hear a phrase here that you may not have noticed before. Another idiom for the Messiah is a nail. Wow, that's a weird symbol, isn't it? I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. This is messianic. Next verse. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. The offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to the vessels of flagons. So this is a messianic allusion out of Isaiah. But verse 25 is a shocker. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Here is one of the several allusions in the Old Testament. The other one is in Daniel 9.27 and other places, which says that the Messiah, which is in view here, will be killed, executed. He will be removed. If you understand what the Great Tribulation is all about, you look at Hosea 5.15 where God says, I will return to my place, meaning he must have left it, until they acknowledge their offense, that's singular and specific, in their affliction they will seek me earnestly. 
And that's what the great, so you ties it all together. But it's interesting, all this is in the Old Testament. We're not talking New Testament yet, really, in a sense. So the key of David, it's, it's the illusion, biblically, is when Eliakim is, uh, is, or, is uh, ordained in his job. Full administrative authority. He carried a heavy key. It was a big loop over his shoulder, carried this key. And it, it was a symbol of his authority. He's the one that would grant access to the king. He alone could do that. That was his, his badge. It's a messianic term, and you can go through Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, all the way through Gabriel's commitment to Mary, that he'd sit on the throne of David. You can, you can tie that all together in Matthew 28, and, of course, in Revelation in chapter 1. We looked at that before. Now, this keys to the kingdom thing is also widely misunderstood because of the incident that happens at uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi. There's two Caesareas, one on the coast, the main one, but there's also one up north, a town called Caesarea Philippi. And they were up there up north when Jesus says, whom do they say, I, who, who do you say that I am, and so forth. And this is where he gives Peter the keys to the kingdom. And, and Matthew chapter 16, we'll look at it here in a minute and show you the passage. The keys were given to Peter, apparently. And of course, the Catholics pick up on that. They say he was the first pope, and let's... There's no evidence. I won't go beat that anymore. But in two chapters later, he gives the keys to all the apostles, not just Peter. It says so. So don't you want to? There's a lot of misunderstanding what that's all about. In fact, Peter in Acts 10 has the door open to the Gentiles. That's what the whole thing with Cornelius is all about: is the doors being opened, and the keys to the kingdom is what is that in, in, in view here? People say, well, Peter was the he, Peter was the guy that had that. No, they all did. And Peter himself clarifies the whole situation in his epistle, first epistle, I'll show you that. But let's look at the verse, the passage that confuses everybody, in effect. He said, then, he said you know, whom do people say I am? Well, some say Elias, some of them are, so forth. He says, he said, then, but whom do you say that I am? And they all looked at each other. But Peter, you know Peter, he's a, a you know, ready, a fire, aim kind of guy, um, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is Peter's finest hour. I mean, he's right on. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it of thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So far, so good. And I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, when you just read this without gestures or any of the background, you assume that, gee, Peter is the rock that he's going to build on it. And it becomes clear, no, he's, he's talking about Peter's faith, and he's probably gesturing to himself. I'll show you why in a minute. The word Petros, in Peter's name, it means a stone, and Petra is a rock or a stone. So there's a play on words here. You're, he, he's not calling him Simon. He's calling him Peter and because, you know, because of this proclamation of faith. Two chapters later, he's going to say, give the same authority to the other apostles. So this isn't unique to Peter. Okay? But Peter himself in his first letter talks about stones or rocks and what he means by that. He says, To whom coming, speaking of Jesus, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as, li- as lively stones are built up uh, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Did you notice a phrase in there that is, is, sounds like an oxymoron? There's a phrase in verse 5. There's four to six there. That's an oxymoron. You see the word a holy priesthood? Okay, I'll, I'll clarify that in the, next, in the next few verses here. Let's go on. Verse six. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. The stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they also were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. There's the word I'm looking for. That's an oxymoron. If you're Jewish, you really understand that the Levites, the priests were out of the tribe of Levi. Royalty was out of the tribe of Judah. They were to be separate, never cross. But we got a, Peter's using a strange phrase here. 
speaking of you, the church, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's going to be very important for you to understand when we get to chapter 4. There are only three people that were kings and priests at the same time. Melchizedek, Genesis 14, that is celebrated in Psalm 110 and then the Epistle of Hebrews 5 through 7. He was he's both a king and a priest. Jesus Christ is a king and a priest. Who's the third? The church, right on. And that's going to be important when you get to chapter 4. You'll see why when you get there. But you are a chosen generation, a royal, priest, a, holy, a royal priest, a holy nation, peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he makes, he makes this remark, but notice his whole presentation of the rock, the foundation, isn't himself. It's Jesus Christ. So people misunderstand Matthew 16 because they're looking at it out of context. They don't see the whole picture. Okay. Now, when you get from Matthew 16, you move a couple chapters forward to Matthew 18. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so that power, that, that, that authority, that power was uh, devolved on the apostles. Okay, so we've got through the title of Jesus Christ, a very rich one. That's why I spent some time on it. Now we get to his, the good news. I know thy works. That's good news right there. Jesus knows what you're doing. And Jesus uh, has that on the credit account. As he looks at the good news back, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Boy, the good news is piling up here. Think of, just visualize this being your report card. Got an open door before you, and no one can shut it. And you have a little strength, and you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Boy, that's fabulous. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, to know that I have loved thee. Now, if you've been counting, how many of, there are, of these are there? Huh? Seven. Good name. Good, good, good. That's because seven because I haven't shown you verse ten yet. That's the seventh. There's six here. Let's take the first six before I get to the tenth one. Seven commendations. I know thy works. Good. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength, has kept my word, has not denied my name. And I'll, behold, I'll, I'll have them come worship at your, your feet, and then I'll also keep you from the hour of temptation. We'll, we'll deal with the seventh one especially. The second one was, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. You know, many of us are trying to get through doors God has shut. <laughs> and the real thing is what we should be doing is making sure we go through the doors that God has opened. There's plenty of those for us to deal with. If you want to get into open doors, 1 Corinthians 16.9, Paul says he has an open door, meaning the mission, there's a mission field that's open to him. And there's lots of other passages you can check that out. There are also doors of deliverance. Jesus said, I am the door. Anyone that comes in but by, but by me is a thief or a robber. And he makes that whole... Uh, uh, discourse in John chapter 10. Noah's Ark had a door, one door. There's only one door in or out of Noah's Ark. Interesting. And who closed the door for Noah's Ark? God did, seven days before the flood. Interesting number. And of course, the door at the wedding, as Matthew 25 talks about. Let's go on. He, thou hast a little strength. That's good. That's great. In other words, you're, you're as, as poor as you are, little as you are, you've got a little strength. That's good. That's good. And has kept my word. Now, this is in a day of denial. They kept God's word. They were loyal. They were steadfast. You'll see that as we get further into the letter. That's our challenge, you and I. Let's cut it, get into it right now. That's our challenge. Do we keep his word? We are in a world that is increasingly critical of of, and disparaging of biblical believers. Any movie, on the radio, in the news, whatever, Christians are always demeaned. Be of good cheer, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. But here they have kept his word and they have not denied his name. That's, you see, I believe that the commandment thou shalt not Take the name of the Lord thy God in vain has nothing to do with vocabulary. It has to do with ambassadorship. Are you a loyal ambassador? 
Or do you buckle at the knees or do you cringe or do you hide when you should be proclaiming? We live in a day where the deity of Christ is blatantly denied even from the pulpits and the seminaries. Every cult, there's all kinds of cults, you could make a list. Every cult has one thing in common. They're all different shapes and sizes. They all have different views about different things, but there's one thing they all have in common. They all find a way to deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And we're in a, in, in a day where those denials and those blasphemies are even in the churches. Not in Philadelphia. And then we get to this very strange illusion that good scholars scratch their head on. Jesus says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Remember, we encountered them back there in the letter to Smyrna. Remember? Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Who on earth is he referring to? The common view in most commentaries is what he's, what the, the allusion here is to what we call legalists, those that try to get us back under the law, that in so doing deny the completed sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Legalism is what the book of Galatians is all about cover to cover. That may be what he has in view here. I happen to have a little different view. It's just my view. I'll show you what I think. The legalists, uh, that's the same as in Revelation 2.9 we talked about. He seems to be talking about people who are false Jews. They claim to be Jews and are not. And it's my suspicion, just personal view, that what's in view here is what we call the Reconstructionists. Most churches, denominational churches, teach a view of the Scripture that because Israel rejected her Messiah, the promises that she was heir to fall upon the church. Their whole theological system is built on the idea that the church has replaced Israel as the apple of God's eye and his focus and so forth because of, of the Jews' rejection of the Messiah. There's a whole theology built around that that is taught in most seminaries and is preached in most churches, denominational churches. It's called replacement theology. And uh, because the, the idea is that the church replaces Israel. Uh, this view is usually accompanied with amillennialism, a belief that Jesus isn't really going to come back and rule the earth. Uh, it is also a theology that laid the foundation, if you will, for the Holocaust in Europe. The Holocaust in Europe, in part, has to be laid at the blame of the silent pulpits that didn't speak out against the abuse of the Jews in Nazi Germany. And even today, it's recurring. You will find anti-Semitism very prevalent in many churches. There are churches that don't see Israel as an element of God's plan of redemption. And it's my suspicion that that's what's in view here. That people who feel that they are heir to those promises, that they're spiritual Jews, if you will, but uh, um, I think this is an indictment of those. I'll leave you to do that on your own. These are the replacement theologies. And he's saying, now, it, what's interesting about this, they'll be compelled to worship. That makes me suspect that even though they are embracing this lie, they still may be saved. They can be saved even though they have an in, in, uh, inaccurate eschatology because they're going to be apparently worshiping at the feet of these others. Interesting. But you can work that. Clearly, though, we do have a day of vengeance coming because that's what Jesus declared in his mandate. And when he read Isaiah chapter 61, the first two verses at the synagogue in Nazareth is recorded in Luke chapter 4. But he stopped at a comma. There's a phrase that he omitted, the day of vengeance of our God. And that's what's forthcoming here. No, I think God loves Israel. Uh, let's take a look at Isaiah 53, first four verses. God is saying... But now this saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. That's what God says. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they will not overflow thee. And thou, when thou walkest through the fire, they shall not be burned. 
Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, and Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. And he goes on and on. No, God loves Israel. He hasn't changed his mind. They've got some tough times ahead, but they stand, they're, they're going to be redeemed. Well, then we get to the key verse of the whole letter. This is a verse that you want to understand and you want to be prepared for the arguments that you may encounter about this verse. Jesus continues, he says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, comma, he's going to do some things here. The word of his patience, he has, Jesus Christ is being patient, he's been, being, he's been patient for 2,000 years. He is standing in the wings to take charge for that which he purchased. So he's being patient. He's asking us to be patient with him. That's what, because you have kept the word of my patience, what's he going to do in, re, in return? I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is one of the most important promises you're going to find in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, and in this, in, among these letters. One of the most important truths of the scriptures that was recovered by the evangelical movements of the 19th century was the Lord's return for his church. For many centuries that had been lost sight of, even among the very faithful uh, ministers and so forth. But in the, in the 18, early 19th century, there was a groundswell of rediscovery and heralding this truth. Thou has, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. That's because you've done that, God's going to do a number of interesting things. Let's stand back a little bit and recall the King David he was anointed for the, uh, the king of Israel, but he didn't take over right away. He was exiled from his kingdom, and he took refuge in a cave in Adullam. You can find that in 1 Samuel 22 and following. He was refused by the people, so he gathered classes of people around him, men in debt, men in danger, and the discontented. And he transformed this crew of irregulars into what was known as the mighty men, David's mighty men. And, of course, the time came when he ultimately left Adullam for his crowning as king of Israel. There's a parallel here with Jesus Christ. You know, he's anointed king. He was anointed king before he was born. But he's exiled at the moment. Physically, that is. Refused by his own people. He came into his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. He gathered some pretty weird classes around him. People like you and me. <laughs> because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour, and it should say of the temptation. In the Greek, there is a definite article before hour and temptation, and in Greek, that's very emphatic. In English, it's not, not such a big deal. It's uh, the, in the Greek, there's a definite article. It is the hour, the time, the season. Notice he's not saying, I'm going to keep you from the tribulation. I'm going to keep you from the time of the tribulation. There's a big difference. Big difference. There are those that are going to say, well, what that means is God's going to preserve you during this time of trouble. That's not what he's saying, and I'll show you why. It's the hour. And it's also the trial or temptation or testing or tribulation, what have you. I will keep you from the time of the, the time of this tribulation. Which shall come upon what? The Jews in Israel? No, the entire world. This is not just a persecution of Christians. This is not just the persecution of the Jews. This is upon the all the world he's talking about. I'll keep you from the time of the tribulation, which will come upon the world for what purpose? What's the purpose of this trouble? To try them that dwell on the earth. Who are the earth dwellers? To try them. To, there's a class of people all consistently through the book of Revelation that dwell on the earth. They're the adversaries. Earth dwellers. It's a distinctive group throughout the entire book. I want you to be sensitive to that because it's going to be very important as you get through the rest of the book. The word dwell there is not okio. It is a different word. It is Katokyo, which is a, to be identified with. These are people, they don't happen to be living on the earth. They're people who dwell on the earth. They're identified with the earth. These are worldlings. 
You and I are not. We're pilgrims passing through. Our eyes in a city that, whose maker is God. But the key phrase here also, in the Greek, it's very clear that it's upon all mankind. It's geographically comprehensive. Now, the question is, the, the post-tribulational types, there's a number of people that have different views. They'll say, well, all this verse means is they're going to have immunity to the troubles of that period. Let's see if that's what the Greek says. First of all, from, I'll keep you from, the word in Greek is ek, which is a preposition meaning out of. I'll keep you out of. It's a removal word. You follow me? The second reason, that there are definite articles in the Greek. It's the hour, the temptation. In the Greek, that's very emphatic, far more so than in the English. There are definite articles. I'll keep you out of the hour of the uh, temptation or tribulation. This, that specificity in the Greek is uh, specific. It's definitive. And it's upon all the world. Revelation 6 through 19 is going to detail that, that seven-year period. And it's going to be, it, it, it's, it's, it's catastrophic. It's catastrophic. And what's the purpose of this time? To try them that dwell on the earth. Let me, tell, let me point out something to you. During the tribulation, the Gentiles, the Gentile believers are not protected. The Gentile, there are certain Jews that are sealed and protected. Set them aside for the moment. Those Jews, the 144,000 that was encountered in chapter 7, are going to evangelize scads of people. The Gentiles that come to faith during that period are murdered, are beheaded. We're going to see their souls under the altar saying, how long, O Lord, until you avenge us, and so on. The Antichrist is going to overcome the saints. We're going to make a big thing when we get to chapter 11, chapter 13, and so forth. All the Gentile believers, all the Gentile believers. Now, there may be an exception here or there, too. I, I, when I say all, I'm not saying 100%, but 99.99, whatever. But the point is, all Gentile believers are going to be killed. That's the whole issue. If you take the mark, you're okay. If you take a mark, you can't be saved, ever. So that's, that's the admonition we're going to get into. That means the people who don't take the mark are going to be killed. It says again and again and again. So you can't apply this to the idea that what Jesus is talking about is that he's going to give you immunity to these troubles. No, he's going to take you out of that period of time. You with me? We're together? Okay. And then we get to the concerns. That's the next natural part. I've got listed on the screen the concerns that Jesus has for the people of Philadelphia. I mean, things that they didn't do well. That's a large blank space on the scroll there, isn't it? I just put it that way to make an emphasis here. There is no concern. If you've been following the structure, there's the title, there's a commendation, you see, and now we have an exhortation. Behold, I come quickly, or suddenly, be more precise. Um, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Boy, uh, that's interesting. He mentions crown here. There are two crowns mentioned, one in Smyrna, one here, and those are the two letters of which there is nothing bad said. They have crowns mentioned, kind of interesting. Um, but there's something else about this crown. When do you receive it? You must already have it. Hold fast to that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You can't take it from you unless you've already got it. You have a crown. If you've earned it, you have it. It's a possession. You may not know that. You can't feel it, but behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We're going to talk a lot about crowns in the next, uh, chapter, or in the next chapter, chapter 4. Hold fast. That's his primary admonition. He's not asking you to do anything new, guys. Hang on to what you've got, because you're doing well, at you, what, you're, what you're doing so far. That is, the, no, that no man take thy crown. Let no man rob you, in effect. You remember Esau, firstborn, he lost his place to Jacob. You go through the Bible, a lot of people blew it. Reuben was the firstborn. He lost his place to Judah, messing around with his father's concubine. 
At Meribah, Moses himself was superseded by Joshua because he blew it. At Meribah. One little, here's a guy that spent 40 years in Egypt, then 40 years in Midian, and then took over, and then spent 40 years in the wilderness. He's been at it 120 years, and he blows it at Meribah. Okay, Moses, you can't go to the promised land. Joshua will take over. You want to understand what that was all about in Numbers 20 and Deuteronomy 3. Saul, King Saul, the first king of David, he lost his place to David. Shebna lost his place to Eliakim, we just mentioned. Joab and Abiathar lost their places to Benaiah and Zadok. And Elijah was even superseded by Elisha. Of course, Elijah's not through yet. He was at the transfiguration. He and Moses were planning, I believe. Well, we get to that when we get to Revelation 11. We'll talk about that. Okay, so that's the letter. There are, as I say, four levels of application. We've talked about the local application. Let's talk a little about a little history of Philadelphia after the New Testament period. During the 14th century, now we're going to fast forward now, 1,300 years. The, the Muslims have risen since the 7th century, and they're starting to overrun. During the 14th century, the city of Philadelphia stood alone against the entire Turkish Empire as a free, self-governing Christian city in the midst of this Turkish land. Everything else had fallen. They're hanging in there. Can you imagine? We're talking roughnecks. We're talking the armies of uh, Islam. They were twice besieged by great Turkish armies, people reduced to starvation. They learned to defend themselves, and they resisted to the very end. And finally, in the 14th century, from, 30, from uh, roughly, call it 30, the last... Uh, uh, decade or so of the century, they finally uh, caved in to the Turkish and the Byzantines. They held, they held fast. They held fast. That's, uh, just as Sardis was a name but with, that was empty, here's Philadelphia, that whatever else, they hung in there to the end. Pretty impressive. Well, now we have the promise of the overcomer, the last major part of the little letter. He says, him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? See, a pillar was a big thing to people who had tremors for several decades of earthquakes. A pillar meant solidity, solid, something. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Here's a place. Their, their name had been changed and changed and changed. Hey, they're going to have, the, I'll give you the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. We're going to see that in chapter uh, uh, 21. And I will write upon him my new name. You know, it's interesting. Sardis had a name but was dead. The last letter, right? Philadelphia, Jesus says, I, I'm gonna, I'll write upon the name, 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 name is all through here, right? What does is what is the names have to do with? My God, my God, my God. Four different times. Jesus says, my God. That's interesting for Jesus to say that because there's only one time that I know of with the exception of this letter that Jesus ever said, my God. And that was his first scream from the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the only time in eternity that he didn't call him Father. Why? Because he was in our place. He couldn't. But anyway, we have the echoes of it here. A temple of my God, the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and so forth. Now, this new name is listed all through Revelation chapter 14, chapter 19, chapter 16, and so forth. The new name is, we're going to hear more about that as we go. Then we have this final closing phrase that closes the letter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's take a look. Okay. We have the name Philadelphia, friendly city, friendly fellowship, if you will. The title Jesus used, holy and true, and the one with the king of David, he has the, his character. It's, it's the, in a sense, the highest uh, uh, appellation of all the letters. Then he has his commendation and uh, the exhortation all wrapped together, promise to the overcomer. And the thing we notice, there are no concerns. There's two churches that really come off well, Smyrna and Philadelphia. We're going to discover that Sardis and one other, guess who it would be? <laughs> the one that's left. We're going to talk about that next time. Okay. Well, we, each one of these letters, we say, have, has an application to all churches. Ephesus, 
the main message there was Jesus would have devotion, not just doctrine. They were very diligent in keeping out false doctrine. Great, but they didn't have time for the king. You'd lost your first love. Smyrna was just under pressure. Just hang in there, guys. Just endure the persecution you're under. Pergamus is the marriage of the world. The admonition of the church is stand against the world. In your churches, you should fight against marrying the world. It's not Easter, it's Passover. Okay? And on we could go. I could also say it's not uh, uh, Sunday, it's Saturday. It's Shabbat. Shabbat's the seventh day. But don't let that be a hang-up. Paul says, let no man judge you in the keeping of any holy day or any Sabbath day. So don't make that a point of division. But if you're really going to do your homework, do your homework. Thyatira, paganism. All the paganism that came out of Babylon repackaged into Latin labels to become a married part of the state church. And Sardis, obviously a name that was dead. They're the application there is watchfulness and diligent. Be diligent. Don't be a Sardis. Philadelphia had a missionary outreach. What they were doing was great. Just keep at it, guys. Laodicea will surprise you as to that application. When we get there, we won't take next time's lesson this time. We talked about open doors earlier. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, he says, I'll tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Just because a door is open doesn't mean there aren't adversaries. Part of your discernment that you pray for is to understand what's an open door on the one hand and be sensitive to the fact that if you're drawing heavy fire, that must be a very important door that's open. So understand the difference between a closed door and simply having a lot of uh, attention. But the thing, uh, uh, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. The economy in the Philippines today is really in the tank. It's really down. So there are many Filipinos that look for work outside the Philippines. Many of them go to Saudi Arabia where they can get hired as menials, as servants, and so forth. And they work and send their money back to, the, to, to their families at home. How many do you think Filipinos are employed in Saudi Arabia today? 900,000. And probably half of those are Christians. And I heard one scholar recently, a good friend of mine, speculated, it would be just like God to be putting pressure on the Philippine economy in order to get people saved in Saudi Arabia. That sounds preposterous until you remember that God had the whole world go into tax registration to get two people to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That same God put the whole world in a famine to get a family of 70 in Israel down to Egypt where there was food. And you go on, examples. God's ways are God's ways. Interesting. There are doors that are open. I'm going to be uh, uh, visiting the Gospel for Asia in India. K.P. Yohanan has been there. Well, he's been there for about 25 years. He's trained 14,000 pastors that now are planting 16 new churches per day, per day. Four million decisions for Christ last year. You know, we look at America, we think of Christian America, and that's a joke. If you take a look at America through God's eyes, it's a pretty dismal scene. I won't start that, go down that, through that in this discussion here. But while there is this anti-Christian groundswell starting to emerge in our society as we are tearing our heritage up by its roots and dis uh, disabling two, two centuries of God's blessing upon us. The w doors are opening all over the world for the gospel. If you want a sign of the end times, yes, you can talk about nuclear this and that and whatever. Just look at look what's going on evangelically, and it's exciting. Well, now let's talk personally. We talk about churches. Each one of these applies to us personally. Ephesus really is an issue of neglected priorities. They thought they were doing well. Strict doctrine and so forth. They didn't have time for the king. They neglected the, the number one priorities is your devotional time. You'll learn about God through your expositional time. You develop your reverence for God in your devotional life. Smyrna, satanic opposition. Yes, they were dying like flies. Satan was having a field day, but they recognized what it was. 
What Satan couldn't accomplish, persecution he accomplished by marrying. The whole era, the personal application of Pergamos is spiritual compromise. Don't compromise spiritually. Understand what the way God looks at things and embrace them. It's not a question of what he allows. Can, can a Christian do this? Can a Christian do that? Isn't the issue. Find out what God prefers. That's what you chase. It's not what you can't do. It's what you want to do. Thyatira, of course, pagan practices. That's straightforward. Sardis, again, it's watchfulness and diligence. Philadelphia, I'm going to suggest the issue there is loyal ambassadorship. Hold fast, he says. Stay loyal. Don't deny his name. Hang in there. You and I need to understand that if we take on the name of the king, we better represent the king faithfully. That's what it's all about. Laodicea will, will surprise you when we talk next time. Overcomer's promises, tree of life at Ephesus, not heard of the second death. Each one fits their own situation. Uh, the hidden manna for Pergamos, the power of the nations. They, if Tyre, Tyre wanted power, Jesus will give them power when the time comes. Uh, Sardis is the right, name not blotted out. And so Philadelphia, pillar of the temple, name of God, name of the city, his new name. Laodicea, we'll leave till next time. And let's not lose sight of what the overcomer is. A lot of people get into that and start getting under the law again. Read Galatians again. Read the book of Romans again. No, no. John tells us, what's, the same guy that wrote the book of Revelation, he writes a letter, he says, whatsoever is born of God be overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's a faith issue. It's not legalism. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's, that's the, the beginning and the end of it. Okay, we've talked about all those. Let's talk about prophetic now. This is the surprise, perhaps, some. We have, of course, as I said, you know, the, the seven letters. We have the apostolic church, the persecuted church, the married church, the medieval church, the non-national church, and now we have the missionary church. Okay, great. The first three have the overcomer processes postscript, as I mentioned. The last four will have the promises in the body of the letter because they endure to the end, each one of them in its way. And uh, each one of the last four letters includes an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ. That's another distinctive of the last four. And of course, Thyatira has the threat that if they don't shape up, they will go into the Great Tribulation. Sardis is silent on that subject. The missionary church is promised to be out of here. That promise is precious. I wouldn't hang the whole doctrine of that on that verse alone, but frankly, it's enough. We're going to find just as compelling evidences in chapter 4 and just as compelling evidences in chapter 5. So, um, uh, so you want to pray about that and pray that I'm right. <laughs> no, you want to come to your own conclusions from your own study. I'm just expressing why it is we hold those views because you will encounter those views and you'll, you'll want to do your uh, careful study to come to your own conclusions. Okay, next session. Thought we'd never get there, didn't you? For the next session, I want you to read again the whole chapters, chapters 2 and 3. Read all seven letters. There's a value in doing all seven over and over again. If you were a class, I'd say, I want you to read it 30 times between now and the next meeting. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Then I want you to outline the next letter, which is obviously the last of the letters, the seventh letter, letter to Laodicea. And that's Revelation uh, the 14 through 22, in chapter 3. And as you outline it, pay attention. What are the distinctives? What makes Laodicea different than all the other seven? What remedies were necessary to repair the church at Laodicea? As you can gather already, that there's, it's got some problems, obviously. What does it have to do to repair? What, what, are the, what remedies are necessary? I have another thing I want you to do for next time because I think we're going to be able to dismiss Laodicea in, in probably uh, half the time. We can, if, it won't be a, a lengthy diatribe. That's the good news. But uh, we're going to, I want you in preparation for next time's a rather unusual assignment. I want you to read Matthew 13. You may want to read... Matthew chapter 12 in order to be able to answer the question, what, hap what caused Matthew 13 to happen? Because from Matthew 13 on, Jesus only speaks publicly in parables. If I was giving you a quiz next time, I would say, uh, ask you, why did Jesus use parables? If you say, to make things clearer, you flunk. It's, the, it's just the opposite. And check it out, because he'll explain it to you in Matthew 13. But more to the point, 
He's going to tell you things in Matthew 13. So there are seven parables there. And they are things, they deal with things that are hidden since the foundation of the world, Jesus says. That means that if they were hidden since the foundation of the world, these are things that are not in the Old Testament. That's a surprise. I thought everything was in the Old Testament. No, these seven things deal with something that was hidden since the foundation of the world. What is that? And we're going to talk about that next time. So you want to, why did he speak in parables? And what secrets are revealed in Matthew 13? And the other question that's sort of implicit here, what on earth does this have to do with seven churches? And we'll deal with that the next time. And the other thing, if I was giving you a quiz, you might and do, this on a, do this in your notebook. Jot down the primary things that this, this, see, this will close, if you will, what I'll call unit one of the book of Revelation. Because the following session will go into chapter four and a whole other subject. What have you learned? What do you feel? What have you personally gained? Jot it down. What, what, did, you, what did you personally gain from these eight, it would be nine sessions by then, um, from, the, from the study? So that's your assignment for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this precious, precious book that you've given us. We thank you, Father, above all, for Jesus Christ, the one that's holy and true and the one that has the keys of David. We thank you for this letter. We thank you for its encouragement. And yet, Father, we also recognize the need for your supernatural equipping and protection and sealing and shielding. Father, we would pray that if there's any among us that have yet to make a commitment to you, they wouldn't leave this room without doing so in the privacy of their own will. And yet, Father, for all of us, we do pray that you would put a hedge about us, that we might have that assurance that whatever troubles beset us, we know they're Father filtered, that you have a purpose in them, that we don't have to understand that purpose, we just have to trust you. We also pray, Father, you give us discernment for what are open doors. Keep us, Father, from trying to open doors you've closed, but rather, Father, that we might be bold and effectual for the doors you have opened. And Father, we just pray that you too would shield us and protect us from the adversary. We know that he's not happy about what's going on here. We do pray, Father, that our thoughts, our words, our footsteps would be guided by your Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that you would draw us ever closer to yourself and to Jesus Christ that we might be ever more fruitful stewards of these opportunities, that we might bear fruit that would be pleasing to you. As we commit ourselves this evening, without any reservation whatsoever, into your hands, wholeheartedly, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.